Dear friends, uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, respected Professor Friedman, uh, uh, I have really great honor to, to greet you today all at the round table we have organized uh, under the uh, subject that you saw it, uh, I have to be precise, uh, well, ideologies and political theory today, state of affairs. And this is generally the idea uh, to uh, try to use opportunity that we have uh, of Professor Friedman to share some thoughts with us and on the other hand for us to display some of the issues that we've been working uh, uh, here upon. Uh, I will just give a couple of um, uh, uh, log logistic uh, 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 remarks before we start actually. Uh, uh, you have list uh, uh, of the uh, uh, lectures and uh, interventions that you will have. Uh, uh, there is but one change actually only unfortunately Professor Lakicevic, our former director here, had intervention yesterday, legal, and he is not able to join us unfortunately. Uh, it came out something is not uh, uh, as serious but uh, he is not able unfortunately to speak today and so on. Uh, we miss still uh, uh, Professor Samojic who also has some uh, uh, medical treatment but will join us somewhere about I think 12 and we expect uh, uh, Jacqueline Anovic is to join us. The rest are here and we can start. Uh, so just uh, a couple of uh, uh, remarks before I give floor to Professor Brady. First of all, I would like to thank to uh, uh, Fund for Open Society and Mr. Sergej Jurovic, uh, who uh, might also pop up here, who have helped us really with uh, 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 paying the ticket actually and uh, facilitating the coming of uh, uh, Professor Freedom with us. Uh, I will, uh, speaking about Professor Freedom, I will try uh, briefly to present him. Uh, in, in a way, it's really, uh, when you speak about ideologies today, uh, of course, uh, there is one journal, it's called Journal of Political Ideologies, that has been established and led uh, by uh, Professor Frieden. Uh, and But generally, uh, uh, Professor Frieden uh, is uh, the first name that somehow uh, you connect with the ideologies, the study of ideology. As he said, like 20, 25 years ago, when he was uh, really developing that, he was criticized by some philosophers, basically, that it is inferior studies and so on. And then generally, if anyone has contributed uh, uh, to uh, the fact that actually uh, studying of ideology today is a very serious job, it is Professor Freeman. Uh, there are many of the things that I could speak about uh, upon him. Uh, he's, uh, he's been working at Mainstream College at Oxford for a very long time. He's Professor Emeritus uh, of Oxford. Uh, uh, he has written his auto, I think, somewhere about 13 or 14 uh, uh, books. Uh, uh, for example, he is the person uh, who have uh, uh, again uh, uh, put the light to uh, 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 Hobson and uh, uh, somehow revived the interest for him, uh, actually, who have uh, uh, written about very different uh, issues, subjects, and persons, and so on. Of course, he is the best known for his uh, classical already book. Uh, small volume of 600 and more pages uh, uh, speaking about political theory and ideologies and uh, in our language uh, uh, so to speak actually in a western uh, if I may say uh, uh, variant of our language in Croatia they have translated it was I think 10 15 years ago uh, his uh, collection uh, a reassessment of uh, political ideologies very very nice uh, introductory work into uh, ideology uh, studies uh, so uh, we got the, the chance uh, finally to, to have him uh, with us in, in Serbia and this is his uh, third day uh, in Serbia for the time it was quite intensive uh, and uh, we have been uh, in Matica Srpska uh, on Monday uh, visited uh, this institution have a very nice chat with uh, Professor Stanić who is the uh, president there and uh, have a very nice walk and acquaintance with uh, Novi Sad. Yesterday uh, we had a couple of uh, uh, interesting meetings and interview at national television uh, for Politica Daily uh, and so on. And uh, there was really very nice and inspirative lecture and after that debate at the Faculty of Political Sciences, some of us have been there. And this was meant to be, how should I say, the peak of uh, his uh, 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 visit uh, to the Belgrade. Uh, this is the round table in which, as I said, uh, we expect to have some interesting uh, debate and uh, exchange of thoughts and so on and so on. Uh, 
Um, uh, one thing that I have first to uh, warn the guys who have been invited to uh, speak about is that we have idea to publish a collection of work. If we uh, all get satisfied with the material that we might produce today, the idea is to work upon one uh, uh, decent uh, collection uh, of works on ideology and political theories today. And I will not uh, take more time. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming uh, uh, today, and I hope this will have fruitful discussion. The broadening of the, of the sphere, of the arena of ideology research, and recognition over the past 30 years is a crucial mark of the success of ideology studies. And it's emerged out of a number of shadows. The Marxist conception of ideology that insisted that ideology would disappear, the dismissal, as we just heard, of ideology by political philosophers as an inferior form of argumentation not worth wasting time on, uh, uh, the American political science view of uh, ideologies that reduce its investigations into attitude and opinion studies, uh, uh, statistical uh, uh, methods, uh, or, and this is what I want to concentrate on for a few minutes, the mission of ideology critique uh, uh, to challenge the ethical defects of ideology. And so I begin by taking the assumptions of ideology critique, ideology criticism, one by one, because they, more than most, um, played a part in suppressing the emergence of ideology studies as a serious intellectual enterprise. So here are the assumptions of uh, uh, ideology critique is still very strong uh, across the continent of Europe, uh, uh, not least, of course, in Germany. So point number one of that approach. As with Marx and Engels, ideologies are false or distorted consciousness. That implies, by default, the superior existence of something called true consciousness. But those who have claimed that unsurprisingly turn out to have competing versions of what true consciousness is. And competing versions of the truth immediately acquire the features of ideological contestation. But by now, the study of ideology has, generally speaking, the study of ideology, not being ideological. The study of ideology has lost interest in whether they are true or false. That's not the point. Because true or false ideologies have an enormous impact on the way people think and behave. What ideology studies now concentrate on is to understand ideologies for what they are. As, for instance, historians or anthropologists would approach their subject matter, trying to make sense of what they observe. And ideologies provide maps of the social and political terrains that they address. Of course, they may, and they have been, and they will be manipulative, unreasonably biased, instruments of even oppressive political action. That is not the whole story. Nor is it inevitable that that is what happens with ideology. The analysis is failing to convey social truths and reality decenters the far more important value that the ideologies have as containers of crucial social meaning. <coughs> the second point of ideology critique. Ideologies, and we will all know this, are temporary entities and will wither away. And again, this is a prognosis common not only to Marxist analysis, but to the American end of ideology debate, which emerged in the 1950s and 1960s. But that is possible only in a view that all human political thinking will converge on a single point. And even if it were to converge on a single point, then this would still be one ideology, rather than none. And this is not only absurd fantasy, but it would talk to the richness and the diversity of the human imagination. Consensus may be good in some senses, but it may be impoverishing in others. 
And the third point of ideology critique. <coughs> they, they use ideology as a singular, as a monolithic, undifferentiated term. And throughout the history of the word ideology, both critics of ideology and users of ideology have chiefly employed it in the singular. There's something called ideology. But this is more complicated for two reasons. First, because the different uses of ideology are not just sub-variants of a more inclusive phenomenon. They point in very different directions and are to some extent mutually incompatible. And second, because responsible social scientists are interested in what ideologies say. What is the reasoning behind ideological argumentation? And what ideologies can and cannot accomplish as forms of political thinking? Thus, for example, the morphological analysis of ideologies that I have developed builds up from the micro of the detailed uh, forms of ideological discourse to a much more differentiated macro, not the single macro of ideology, but the more complex arrangement of many forms of ideology. And this tries to emphasize their, their fluid, their multiple, their constantly changing nature of the various components that combine in formation of ideologies. So the morphological approach starts by postulating the political concept as the basic ideological unit and sees ideologies as fluctuating and contingent combinations of such concepts. Each of which has got huge significance culturally and contextually. So it's not so much the case of these different arguments about liberty and, 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 and uh, democracy and equality and justice fit together in a particular way, but how they are arranged and how they uh, uh, form each, each, each other's uh, area of, of significance. And I, I give the example of, of modular furniture. You have the same units of furniture, but you can construct very, very different rooms by shuffling the units of furniture around. And this is, I think, exactly what happens with ideologies. They may all have the same concepts, but the, in, in, in some areas, the, if, if you open the, the liberal room, the notion of liberty sits in the middle of the room. If you open the conservative room, liberty is also, also there, but it may sometimes be tucked up against the corner and wheeled out when the guests arrive. <laughs> So we're talking about internal uh, distinctions here. And ideologies also allocate different weight, different intensity, different importance to the concepts that they use. Again, they may use the same words, the same concepts, but give them different weight. And because ideologies are essentially contestable, and I think we'll hear about this more later today, uh, ideologies, one of their functions is to decontest the inevitable ambiguity, the inevitable indeterminacy. Language is, is ambiguous. Language is indeterminate. But we cannot make political decisions based on indeterminacy. So ideology, one of the roads of ideology is to say, this is what justice means. Well, that is what justice means. This is what liberty means. No, no, that is what liberty means. Uh, some form of decision as to which meaning of the word we are going to run with is crucial in order to understand it or make sense of the word and produce written decisions. And the fourth uh, 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 feature of, of ideologies is that, of ideology critique rather, is that ideologies should be unmasked, whereas my Arguments that ideology should not be unmasked is not the point, it should be decoded. Because when you talk about unmasking, that suggests that there's some mask, once you tear it off, then something truly emerges. And I, can, I would argue, well, either masks are not important, or 
I'm interested in the mask. It's the mask that tells us much more about the nature of a particular ideological structure than some assumption that there's, that there's something else behind the mask. So if we understand the study of ideology as a decoding enterprise rather than unmasking enterprise, we begin to pose an entirely different set of questions on which investigating ideologies can focus. So decoding doesn't focus on critique. I mean, of course, we can criticize ideologies. I, 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 I do this myself, but not as part of my scholarly work. Uh, what we need to do is uh, to focus on piecing together meaning from among a larger pool of what speech acts, what ideas, or what public spectacles, and so on and so on, might signify. And here, for instance, the anthropologist Clifford Geertz's reference to the drawing of social maps is crucial. But scholars may provide very different maps than ideologists. In other words, the observers who provide different maps than the participants. And one of the roles that we have as, as scholars of ideology is to identify changing patterns that are not immediately obvious at face value, and are not immediately obvious to those who actually are engaged in uttering ideological positions. And in their functional mode, the ideologies play indispensable political roles, irrespective of whether they are of, uh, central to the concerns of ethical and philosophic analysis. This is a different enterprise. I'm not saying that we shouldn't test ideologies in terms of their, of, of their rightness or wrongness, or goodness or badness, or, or their ethical content, but I'm engaged in a slightly different enterprise. Uh, so ideologies mobilize and recruit support or opposition to political bodies and movements. They integrate or separate or break up the cohesion uh, that societies uh, try to have. They rank priorities for social action. This is more important than that. That is more urgent than this. They provide legitim legitimacy or delegitimacy uh, 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 for distributions of power. They serve as a mechanism through which social order or disorder is handled and promoted. And they offer collective visions that inspire, animate, disturb, or shock their conceivers. And all this is part of what I would say the turn in political theory over the past 10, 15 years uh, that examines not the grand structures of political thought, but the minutiae and the details. I think there's a general tendency in the social sciences and in cultural studies to look at the what we used to call the small print, small print of the future. The fifth uh, uh, argument of ideology critique is that ideologies are dominant or hegemonic power structures. And I've been asked this in, in interviews yesterday as well. So in one version of ideology, ideologies are superimposed by those who control and monopolize oppressive, possibly, social, and political power. And of course, unquestionably, ideologies are forms of power. But this observation comes with two caveats, with two reservations. First, ideologies are not only forms of power. That will be to, again, to uh, impoverish a rich set of thought practices. Ideologies are extraordinary means of human communication, of social imagination and of collective commitment to an engagement with the world. And second, power is not only domineering or oppressive or stultifying, and it isn't simply imposed externally on subalterns. Power is everywhere, power is ubiquitous, and power is indispensable. We cannot imagine a society which would have the power drained away from it. It would collapse in a state of paralysis. So on this view, power more commonly entails enabling, facilitating, doing, acting, accomplishing, organizing, making something happen that would not otherwise happen. 
And all this is especially pertinent to ideologies because they are action-oriented types of, of language that aim at preserving or changing or criticizing social and political arrangements. And power is not just power in terms of, of force or domination or, or aggression. Power in language, and ideology is about language to begin with, power in language adopts the forms of persuasion, of reasoning, of emotion, of feelings, and yes, also threats. And the particular cadences of rhetoric that enjoy cultural resonance in a given society. And each society has its own cultural rhetoric, so to speak. So if you want to be successful in promoting an ideological position, you have to have a very close ear to the kind of language that works best in the, among the target audience you wish to address. And ideologies are also far more fragmented and vulnerable than Marx or even Gramsci suggested. There are endless and unresolved competitions over the control of public political language. If you press me against the wall and, and ask me what are really ideologies, what's the main thing about ideologies, this is what I would say. There are competitions over the control of public political language. Whoever controls public language holds a society with a scruff of its neck. And most societies and cultures, rather than being hegemonic, are sites of incessant rivalry and positioning among different ideological standpoints, which confront each other in a continuous succession in the melee of rising and falling power relationships. And as the tempo of political discourse has dramatically increased over the past half century, partly as, as a result of mass media digitalization and spin and the short life accorded to political memoranda and policies and programs, ideologies have become the equivalent of fast food in terms of the way we uh, organize our thoughts, our political and social thoughts. And the sixth argument of, of the ideology critique people. It's an ideologies are deliberate and conscious ideation constructs. Somebody's there manipulating, trying to think how best to uh, produce some sort of propaganda that will affect target audience. And of course, there's no doubt ideologies do possess a large degree of intentional design. And they function as suggested solutions to socio-political challenges. But ideologies, and that is very vitally important, ideologies also operate at unconscious or quasi-conscious and unpremeditated levels. And that is at least as significant a feature of ideologies as their overt articulation and dissemination. And it indicates contra those who regard ideologies as instruments of dominating power that actually ideologies exhibit a notable lack of control over the messages that they convey. And this lack of control occurs on two levels. The one is, is, uh, has to do with what the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur has brilliantly called the surplus of meaning. <laughs> Whatever we say, when we think, when I think at the moment, as I speak, that I'm in control of my sentences and the meanings, you may read something else into what I'm saying that I am not aware of. The messages transmitted by a writer, by a speaker, or an artist, or whatever, contain elements unintended by and invisible to them. This, of course, applies to ideologies as well. And that's why it's so important also to, to develop sensitivity to the unconscious messages. And, of course, the people who who actually transmit those messages don't know, but the, the observer, the analyst, the scholar may see some sort of un unconscious pattern that the, that the participant, that the, that the actor, the speaker, does not recognize. And the uh, second uh, level of the unconscious is familiar, of course, to literary critics. No author can control the reception of the text or the artifact that they produce. They, you know, it's it, what's known in, 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 the, in the field of literary studies is the authorless text. 
eventually the text proceeds in life of its own and the author loses control of the text. And if ideologies are often fragmented and fragile clusters of ideas loosely held together and generated, this is all the more evident when they are consumed, not just when they are produced. So ideologies undergo constant, constant decontextualization and recontextualization, even at, in the same place and at the same time. They are consumed at the same time by different groups who hear and read the same words. They are misunderstood, vulgarized, recrafted, elaborated on, and open to continuous interpretation. And this is, of course, the great strength of ideologies, I would argue. It's not a weakness, it's a great strength. Their adaptability ensures their longevity and their social relevance. Ossified and rigid ideologies will crumble and disintegrate under the slightest pressure. Whereas those open to reinterpretation may have a better chance of survival. So to lay emphasis on the unintentionality of ideologies is a very different matter from claiming that they have hidden underground lives where manipulation can operate unhindered. Quite the opposite. The fact that they have an unconscious existence often protects them from deliberate falsification. Because the manipulator is not actually aware of all of the nuances and meanings uh, 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 of the ideological mes messages or, or, or expressions uh, that uh, they encounter. And finally, the seventh feature of ideology critique. Ideologies are abstract, doctrinaire, and dogmatic. And this is common to the misguided distinction between ideological and pragmatic. I've been haunted with this distinction all my life. And newspapers all over the world say, this is pragmatic, not ideological. And the British press are full of this all the time. And I sort of wipe my brow and say, for heaven's sake, when will they realize that every action, every statement has got ideological content, and what, what they call pragmatic is actually just as ideological as what, is, what they think is ideological. But the choice among those practical parts, so to speak, the pragmatic parts of action, is always channeled through ideological preferences, in the broad sense. Some may be a preference for speedy decisions, some for the quick exercise of authority, some for economic viability, some for a respect for authoritative solutions. And in addition, all so-called pragmatic social policies also make decisions that relate to social justice issues and to prioritizing certain demands rather than others. In short, they invoke the typical political and ideological practices of ranking, okay, this is more important than that, that is more urgent than this, and of future orientation. You know, how do we want our, our immediate future to be in six months' time, or in five years' time, or a longer future in 25 years' time? So the opposition between ide ideology and pragmatism results, once again, from the wrong, to my mind, association of ideology only with an inflexible adherence to ideas irrespective of how they apply to concrete situations. And it overlooks the gradation of ideological intensity that characterizes all ideologies. So the error of those approaches derives from a number of causes. First, the unwillingness of many analysts and commentators and political journalists and ordinary language users to recognize that ideology, like all linguistic and ideation constructs, exhibits semantic fluidity and diversity. And second, the difficulty to recognize that ideologies ascend as much from bottom up as they are imposed from up down. In fact, it's much more likely that ideologies move from down up. They are vernacular, everyday, loose frames of references that are then maybe filtered and channeled through more organized uh, uh, ways of, of reproducing them. Uh, uh, but there are these loose frames of references through which the socio-political world is comprehended or miscomprehended. And the third error here is the mistaken assumption that ideologies come in neat packages with clear boundaries between them rather than flowing one into the other. There are never clear-cut boundaries between ideological positions 
between liberalism and socialism, or liberalism and conservatism, or, or even uh, some forms of authoritarianism and non-authoritarianism. There's a very fluid mixture. The, they, they, uh, the ideas of, at least at the margins, trickle across these imaginary boundaries. So I will, do I have a few more minutes? Or should yeah, I say? Yeah, okay, uh, not, not too long. Um, so I want to now end with these seven arguments against ideology critique and move slightly to, to, to slightly other things, different things. The study of ideology of the past 20, 30 years has benefited immensely from the opening up of channels of cross-fertilization between disciplines, such as anthropology, Wittgensteinian philosophy, the, in particular uh, his notion of language games and family resemblances, hermeneutics, linguistics, and post-Marxist studies. Thus, to take one example, uh, 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 Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, uh, who were assigned to ideology an articulatory role, articulatory role, sorry, that, that holds together social dislocations and antagonisms and enables the formation of a social identity. Well, Slavoj Žižek, who writes about one book every six months uh, about uh, this subject and similar subjects, um, has related uh, the study of ideology to Lacanian psychology and presented ideology as a phantasmic and often pleasurable substitute, jouissance, uh, which is the, the Lacanian uh, uh, phrase here. Uh, uh, a pleasurable substitute for the inevitable impossibility of getting a grasp on the real world. Because we have no view of the real world. I mean, if we talk about unmasking, basically what, what, what Zizek says is that you take off the mask and there's another mask. You take off the, that mask and there's another mask. Finally, at the end of taking one mask, there's no face, there's nothing. Uh, so this is a rather extreme way of trying to, to say that masks are ways of of protecting us from the horrible realization that there is nothing certain in the world. And we are also much more sensitized to the, exist the existence of ideologies outside logos. In performativity, for example, demonstrations, parades, ceremonies, rituals, body language of, 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 of uh, uh, um, border uh, police, for instance, when you go from one country to another, it tells you very much about what's happening. I mean, it's obviously a, tip, a typical sample of how that society behaves, but the way people behave to individuals who move through border control is, it tells you a lot about, about certain ideological assumptions. Uh, carnivalesque behavior, and it, and it appears, it is, it is saturated in visual form. Uh, uh, not, not only posters, uh, but, but shrines, uh, monumental architecture, cinema and TV, the layouts of cities. Those of you who may have been to Washington DC will know that the, 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 if you walk from the Lincoln Memorial to Capitol Hill, it's, it's dripping with ideological meaning. I mean, everything, you know, the, the, the whole sort of the, the, the national imagined important history of the United States is laid out to you through its museums of space, uh, through uh, uh, the, 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 the monuments, through the, the Greco-Roman architecture of, 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 of Congress. Uh, th this, is all, this is all really, it's, it's replete with ideological meaning. Not necessarily intentionally, but that's how it happened. And not least, uh, uh, due to the very kind uh, tour of Belgrade that I had yesterday, uh, road names. So we have this wonderful example that you showed me that we have roads with seven names that, it had, that they had over a period of, of a century. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this, has, this, this, is a, this is a massive ideological statement. Because naming roads, uh, I mean, in, in naming roads after events, after, hero, after heroes, after imagined heroes, after whatever, they are, they, are, they are these symbols, they are these sort of forms of maps that say, this is what is important in our lives. And now we cross this, spell out, no longer important. This is what is important now. Cross that out, that is what is important now. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful story, really. I, I found it very illuminating. But there's also the oral impact through, through hearing, through commemorative silences, silence and, and memorial services to the war dead, 
or national anthems, which always have got a, a particular momentous significance attached to them. People are supposed to stand, and they're supposed to be silent in that as well. Um, or sing, of course. And more recently, political psychology has, has a, a, a of insights as to which ideological paths are taken by individuals and why. And in the field of history, conceptual historians have begun to incorporate methods from ideology studies and have moved towards investing in not only the history of a single concept, which is a line, but a cluster of concepts, which is a field, how they bounce off against each other. Concepts, as they move through time, crash into other concepts. Bits of concepts hang and fall off another concept as they go. You can't take the concept of democracy through 2,000 years without realizing that it weaves its way uh, 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 through a, a maze, a, 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 a swamp of, 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 of concepts that drag it down, that raise it up, that, 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 that invest it with meaning or that die this. And uh, not least, uh, uh, the rediscovery of emotion emotion and study of emotion have become now very common in, 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 in social studies. As a modulator of ideology are intrinsic to understanding how ideologies work. They are accepted, ideologies are accepted as contestations over the political mobilization of emotion. Emotions constrain, emotions direct, emotions filter the meanings available to the individual engage in political thinking. We cannot underestimate the importance of emotion in political thought. They serve as power conduits, as mobilizers, or exclusives of support, and they bestow an additional veneer on political vision that can excite and propel, as well as, as, as repel. And finally, uh, the investigation of ideology has been rather slow in catching up with the media revolution. But beginnings are being made. The identification of specific styles of mediatized ideology continues the twofold analysis in the recent analysis of ideologies. From a macro classification of grand belief systems to a micro approach to the normalized ubiquity of political discourse, alongside the increasing awareness of the plasticity of discourse and the disjointedness of discourse. And second, there's a movement from prioritizing elite texts and elite utterances to this vernacularizing and ostensible, and I put it in inverted commas, democratization and popularization of the sources and language of everyday ideology. <clears throat> and concurrently, also an increasingly salient boundary reconfiguration of classical liberal political theory, public and private. Because mediatizations, <coughs> blogs and tweets, for example, uh, uh, or Facebook, are also exercises in political and social self-expression that hover somewhere between the possibly private and the potentially public. They are neither entirely private nor are they completely private. They construct, new, they construct new kinds of public that may still be quite casual, quite random in their accessibility and in their social penetration. In sum, just to uh, uh, round this up, we have ideology, and I just throw out completely different views of ideology as, as drawing of veils of that phantasmic and fantastic, ideology as the articulation of social identities, still have ideologies as distorted belief, ideologies through the lens of discourse analysis, ideologies as conceptual morphology, ideologies as a form of rhetor rhetorical language, ideologies as aggregated attitudes, ideologies as performativity, ideologies as ritual, ideologies as consensus formation, ideologies as the management or mismanagement of agonism and dissent, ideologies as rupture and breakdown, and so on and so on. And all those have been given a fair platform by various researchers. There's no leading ideological school, thank heavens. And that is devoutly to be wished. Uh, uh, in more ways than one, the fragmentation of ideologies over the past generations is mirrored in the multi-perspectives 
and the pluralist absence of a gold standard of what the study of ideologies should be about. Wherever we go, we wade through ideological statements, like Trico, uh, and the elimination, as if this were possible, would signal the end not only of political thinking, but of thinking and emotion in all social contexts. If we were once misleadingly told that the end of ideology had arrived, it appears now that in terms of ideology studies, we are just at the beginning. Thank you very much. I believe that we are witnessing some of reconfiguration in conservative part of political spectrum or in that conservative room. So allow me to give some examples. A few months ago, a leader of German party alternative for Germany, Frau Kepetri, identified five crucial points in her agenda. These are Euro and Euro policy, home security, energy, family, and immigration. When we look at these carefully chosen themes, we can notice that four or five can be subsumed under the category of identity. The same word was mentioned by British conservative philosopher Roger Scruton, as he said that Brexit was not about economy, but about identity. On the other side of the world, Donald Trump uses the same language. More or less similar beliefs are to be seen all around the Europe. So it is not conservatism that mainly cares about free market, but it is a conservatism that it faces other values. It is not about individualistic and unconstrained self-interest. It is about we, a first-person plural, as Roger Scruton puts it. To understand these changes within the conservative camp, we have to go back a little bit. The appearance of the new right had a huge impact on conservative parties. Politicians like Margaret Thatcher and Donald Reagan, or writers like Frederick von Hayek, became heroes of a modern conservatism. In the 90s, almost all conservatives in Europe embraced the free market and free enterprise as a key part of their ideology. Main concern for the conservatives were lower taxes, liberalization, deregulation, privatization, welfare reform, and market economy. Of course, in the Cold War context and creeping socialism from within, this was perfectly understandable. The crisis of the 70s can be seen as a moment at which Keynesianism reached its limits and economic liberalism became an alternative. New Right was a response to the development of a, of a huge welfare state, relentless increase of state share in the gross national product, welfare dependency, family breakdown, and emergence of an underclass unlikely ever to be integrated into the dominant social order. Although the pro-market attitude of the conservatives was a necessity, up to a certain point of course, some tensions between market and other conservative values cannot be overlooked. John Gray thinks that uh, acceptance of Hayek's philosophy means, means no less than undoing of conservatism. In short, Gray claims that conservatives distanced from original ideological and cultural positions capitulated to the rationalist forces and allied with enlightenment utopia. In its crusade against the welfare state, the Thatcherite policy under the influence of Friedman's and Hayek's economic thought, rejected the traditional Burkean caution, skepticism and pragmatism, while turning to dogmatic implementation of its own project. The victim of such policy were traditional authority structures undermined by the dynamism of the free market. Behind the Thatcherite policy stood some kind of Randian individualism with its emphasis on personal freedom which is very much in opposition to an old conservative idea of organic society. In other words, unconstrained market logic works against the first person plural 
which is a presupposition of market itself. Byproduct of this new right policy was also a huge rise of consumerism, materialism, and destruction of cultured traditions. When market is answer to all problems, it is hard to say why some practices deserve to be preserved at the first place. Some conservatives went so far to establish relationship between free market and rise of moral relativism and everything goes mentality. Thus, in Gray's opinion, conservatives cannot any longer refer to evolution and adaptation of institutions, continuity of tradition, and accumulated wisdom of the centuries, since the traditional institutions do not exist anymore. No matter how much Gray's assessments are exaggerated, there is no doubt that uh, integration of free market among the conservative canons puts conservatives themselves in an awkward position. As Anthony Daniels put it, uh, as he was writing up about Margaret Thatcher, in the long run, her, uh, her effect on the country was far from conservative. On the other side, liberals and defenders of the free market were also uncomfortable with an idea of the new right. So high projective conservatism as such, and Milton Friedman thought that Margaret Thatcher was, true Tor uh, was not true Tory, but 19th century liberal. So it was quite difficult for conservatives to maintain their, their distinct identity. Everything was too much confusing. Of course, the policy of the new right faced some opposition within the conservative camp itself. Those men argued that free market fanatism was not conservatism, and that conservatives defend some other more metaphysical values and not only free trade. <coughs> Over the years, this opposition grew stronger. A new generation of self-confident conservatives was born. Faced with globalization on the outside and a fragmentation on the inside, failed multiculturalism, rise of mass immigration, and religious extremism, as well as domestic terrorism, conservatives turn to the question of identity. The question is, who are we? Of, or what it means to be an Englishman or a German or, I don't know. What holds us together? In the end, what is nation? Is it only a political unity? Or are there some pre-political bounds, values, prejudice, pieties, and moral instincts something that holds our political unity together. Or to put it in another way, is there a source of political unity other than the political process itself? So according to this kind of conservatism, we should protect the idea of nation and nation state at the first place in order to even talk about free market or some other kind of institutional arrangement. Political order, I maintain, said Roger Scruton, depends upon the existence of a community that identifies itself as a we. So the root of politics is attachment, the motive of human beings that binds them to place, the custom, history, people who are theirs. Actually, there can be no state without some sense of national identity and every nation tries to create its own state. What holds society together is not some kind of self-interest, as liberals believe. Society is a community of souls, bound together by friendship and love. It rests upon shared religion, shared myths, emotions, convictions, belief, more than upon calculus or coercion. Thus, in order to even have a possibility to speak about justice, institution, or some kind of free market, we must have some defined borders, jurisdiction, and shared identity. We must have some kind of we, or in other words, we have to be a nation and to have a fatherland. Accordingly, conservatives now believe that the duty of a politician is to maintain that first person plural in being. This kind of nation comes before individual. 
Since nation is pre-political community, it means that it shares some distinctive features, such as shared language, shared associations, shared history, and common culture. Of course, nation also involves self-consciousness as a part of a moral character. It is connected to a national loyalty, love of home, and preparedness to defend it. The nation is hereditary entitlement, a burden of duty, and a call to sacrifice. So as for scrutiny, the nation is moral unity based in territory, language, history, and culture, bound up with the self-consciousness of those who are joined by it. In other words, nation is seen as an organic whole uh, with its own life, destiny, and personality. It stands for continuity and destiny of the culturally specific community. Seen from a national perspective, other human values, such as freedom, only make sense in a national, traditional, cultural context. There are no abstract universal values, let alone rights. They receive their meaning only within a national context and specific location. It is quite easy to see an implicit critic of a policy of a new right which hides behind such understanding. Scruton explicitly said that there are more important things than economy and market. Actually, economy or economia without oikos ceases to be a practical science and becomes an ideology instead, an ideology every bit insane as Marxism or fascism. No doubt that Organism can, uh, organisms can be cured by growth, but they can also be killed by it. So conservatives aren't prepared to sacrifice, nat sacrifice national sovereignty, tradition and heritage, to idols of economic growth, global economy, and so on. Of course, no one denies the efficiency of a free market, but it doesn't mean that everything should be put to the market. So conservatives are ready to point out destructive results of economization of all spheres of life. Actually, Scruton believes that many of the tradition can be understood as devices for rescuing human life from the market. Maintaining a national attachment and a way of life is more important than economy. National identity cannot be put to the market because a successful economy depends on shared identity, specifics of respect of private property, religion, family, traditional morality, national state. In other words, social and national conservatism is the foundation of the successful market economy. However, this is not only a fight for a national identity, but it's also a struggle for a distinct, distinct conservative identity. If one takes the German CDU, for example, it is quite hard to say what makes it different from social democrats or liberals. They are distancing themselves from traditional Christian conservative politics. Such a process is also to be seen in Britain, where the conservative party also failed to establish a clear identity during the general election campaign in May 2010. So how can conservative, for example, advocate same-sex marriages or even say that such thing is a highlight of one's career? During the Brexit campaign, we saw that party wasn't united and even unwilling to take Scrutonian position. However, Brexit would be impossible without Tory party and Tory voters. Also, Trump wouldn't become a president without at least a part of the Republican Party. Same divisions were to be seen in presidential election in Austria the last year. So, to conclude, conservatism today is about identity. The identity possesses a twofold significance. First, it means preservation of national identity and a traditional way of life. And second, preservation of its own distinct conservative identity. In this context, conservatives believe that the question of identity will determine the 21st century. Thank you. I will be speaking about the uh, Russian political thought today. But of course, uh, 
I cannot start speaking about uh, contemporary Russian political thought and what it really means without going back to the past. If there is one feature of Russian political thought uh, for the last 300 years, I would say, it is that there is no civilizational consensus uh, within the society, which means that the divisions that we see in other uh, Western European societies uh, are always uh, ones that were, of course, ideological, but there was, uh, uh, and I'm saying this, of course, with uh, having in mind that, uh, that, uh, that I might, might be oversimplifying, uh, is that uh, there was no uh, division about where the country uh, belongs, even geographically. Uh, so from the time of uh, Peter the Great and, uh, and Catherine the Great, uh, Russian uh, elite was divided into two broader camps. In both of these camps, of course, you have many more nuances and, and, and subdivisions. Ones were liberals, and when I say liberals, it is uh, the Russian meaning of the word liberals. As uh, Professor Friedman previously said, the word uh, may mean many uh, different uh, uh, things, uh, uh, as many societies uh, there are, or even more. So, in, in and, and conservatives, uh, in uh, a Russian collective mind, liberal means Western and Western. And uh, in the collective mind of uh, the conservatives, uh, those are the people despisers, uh, so to say, in a way. Uh, and unfortunately, also, uh, there is some ground to, to say so uh, if, uh, if we read uh, some, of, some of the thoughts uh, shared by those. I will just list the, the, na the names of, of uh, uh, main historical uh, uh, figures and, and how this this process uh, developed the process of of uh, ideological struggle in, in Russia uh, in the 18th uh, centuries there were the ta Tatushka uh, all, all older and, and senior and junior then of course Yatsen and the most famous one is Peter uh, Godovich Chadaev uh, who is famous for saying that all of our history all our Russian history represents uh, a chain of barbarities and uh, brutish uh, superstitions uh, and, and so on and so forth. At the same time, he was idealizing uh, West and especially uh, Roman Catholicism, uh, thinking that uh, it would be the best way for Russians to actually uh, also uh, convert to the Western version of, of Christianity. Uh, that meant practically that uh, uh, modernization and westernization at, at the same time, on the identity level. Then, of course, uh, Belinsky, Petrushchev, Turgenev, uh, Sergei Vechayev, who went so far uh, saying that the only way to save Russia is uh, to uh, murder uh, everybody from the I don't know the correct translation in, in, uh, in English, Velikai Eptimia. It's the part of liturgy where all the uh, church and state uh, leaders are mentioned. Lenin praised him for that, obviously, later, later on. On the other side of that historical camp, uh, the first ones were members of the society of the appreciators of the of Russian work. It is uh, Dejavin, Shishkov, uh, Shakovsky, uh, Shalinsky, Shikmatov, and, and, and others. Uh, the stars of the 19th and uh, later on 20th centuries obviously are the Neo-Byzantine uh, 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 Konstantin Leontiev, uh, who wrote his famous books Byzantism and, 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 and Slavkut, and uh, the average European as an ideal of a uh, as an ideal and a tool of of uh, the collective co uh, collective deconstruction, uh, of course, Lav uh, Tikhomirsky, Povedonovsev, uh, Sergei Nimus, uh, a very important name, and uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, not emphasized enough. Uh, Pushkin, who started as a liberal and uh, and later on became a monarchist, uh, so was uh, the case with uh, with uh, Dostoevsky. 
and uh, Durov, who, uh, who was maybe an equivalent to Filmer, uh, because he was the one uh, praising uh, patriarchy as the only holistic principle of salvation of a person and the state uh, according to Christ and his eternal truths. Uh, and of course, uh, Danilevsky, uh, who is the most uh, famous uh, Slavophile, uh, wrote a, a very important book, Russia and Europe. Uh, but as a Slavophile, he was also um, aware of, or, 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 or he was uh, appealing to, to Russians uh, not to fall into the trap of Slavophilia that can also lead towards losing identity. The main concern of Russian conservatives uh, was losing a distinct Russian uh, identity, which is not European. They saw European identity and Russia in it as a periphery, uh, whereas their thought was that uh, Russia is a unique uh, civilization. Uh, so Danilevsky uh, thought that the trap of pan-Slavism may be, may be that through pan-Slavism Russians start appreciating and appropriating uh, using the, the very modern word, appropriating actually Western culture, meaning Roman Catholicism and, and Protestantism. Uh, then uh, the 20th century one, uh, Ivan Ilyin, uh, who is awfully uh, quoted, especially in the last several years by uh, President Putin himself. Uh, then uh, Ivan Solonovich with his, uh, with his uh, uh, masterpiece, People's Monarchy. And of course, uh, the, uh, immigra the immigrant uh, Eurasianists, uh, Trubetskoy, Savitsky, and uh, in 20th century, uh, Lav uh, Gumilyov, uh, uh, whom Misha uh, wrote, uh, wrote a very nice work. Um, today, uh, this uh, division is still obvious. And uh, modern Russia appeared from, uh, from the uh, remnants of a uh, very crude, very uh, thick ideology, non-flexible ideology, as, as you've previously mentioned. And from it, it had a, uh, it had a, an urge to, to define itself. Uh, so uh, the, it adopted the Constitution of 1991. One of the most important features of the Constitution is that it explicitly forbids a state ideology which, uh, in my opinion, is also an ideological statement. Um, later on, uh, there was an attempt to define this, and it was found in the term uh, coined uh, by, um, uh, it was coined earlier, but in Russian, uh, in Russia everybody is pointing into, into one name that coined this term. The uh, term is uh, sovereign democracy. Uh, by uh, Vladislav Yurievich Surkov. Vladislav Yurievich Surkov is uh, what in, in Russia they call the po uh, political technologist or polytechnologue uh, in, in Russian. It is a, a person that, uh, that appears uh, uh, often uh, on, uh, when, when you type his name, that you will uh, see that he is the so-called creator of politics uh, in modern Russia. Uh, so, the sovereign dem democracy, what it really meant, it was a compromise. Uh, democracy, when it was introduced, uh, meant uh, freedom and liberty at the same time, but it also, uh, for, for, for in the minds of, of many Russians, and it connected with transition and, and, and poverty and uh, uh, raider privatization and, and so on, uh, democracy was connected uh, with the uncertainty and loss of sovereignty. Uh, so in order to appeal to both camps, uh, uh, Putin's Russia uh, came out with, with this term. Still, I, I want to emphasize that because of time, I think that I might be oversimplifying, uh, but uh, uh, this is a very important, uh, a very important term. So this was a, a, a term uh, that uh, uh, appeased both camps, uh, in a way, or that was the, the attempt of it. And so is the constitutional, uh, the constitutional solution to forbid ideologies as such. Today in Russia, I would say that there are three broader uh, ideological camps. 
It is uh, the liberals, uh, of course, who derive from the tradition of the liberals that, I, that I've already mentioned. Then the realists, uh, who uh, are arguably, uh, uh, their, their ideological position is arguably uh, created by former Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, Yevgeny Primakov. And uh, there are the, the uh, conservatives. Uh, besides this, we should know that there is another level within the uh, Russian political society. And it is uh, whether uh, people uh, coming from either ideological specter uh, respect, so to say, uh, the state or, or uh, are they part of the system or, or, or are they not. Uh, so there are uh, syst systemic so-called liberals and non-systemic liberals and uh, systemic conservatives and non-systemic conservatives. Whereas realists are only uh, part of, they are uh, the, they're basically the centrist uh, in the country. Uh, what does this uh, actually um, uh, mean in, 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 the, in, in the real life? Uh, liberals, uh, and I'm talking now, I'm, I will only be talking about this, the systemic ones. The, 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 the anti system prote protests happened in Russia, sorry for this digression, but I think it's important to, 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 uh, for understanding, uh, happened in 2011 2012. And they were uh, joined by non uh, systemic people from the whole specter. So you had uh, national Bolsheviks and ultra monarchists and ultra liberals. Uh, all protesting for their own different reasons against the system, against Sistema uh, uh, in, in Russia, so uh, against uh, the, the establishment. Uh, and uh, uh, of course it is possible for cons both conservatives and liberals to, to go in and out of the system, which did happen. For instance, uh, Kudrin, which, who was a minister of, uh, of economy, uh, well, at one point he became an oppositionary, and now he's again part of the system. And also, uh, we can say that for, for conservatives, uh, for people like Zakhar Pelyapik, who, who is a famous, uh, he's a political thinker, but is, as, as, as these borders are not really, uh, not really solid, uh, who, is, who is a famous Russian writer and was an anti, uh, he was against uh, uh, Putin in uh, 2010, 11, during, uh, during the protests, but then after Crimea, he uh, believed that, uh, that uh, the uh, government gained legitimacy again, and uh, he gave the government a second chance. Uh, the way to, uh, to understand and to map who is who in Russia, in a way, is to pose, uh, as I call them, the control questions. One is constitution of Russia. Uh, so whether people think uh, it should be changed or not. People that are realists will never talk about it. They will avoid uh, talk, speaking of constitution. The liberals might talk about it uh, in a way that the state should, of course, uh, 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 lose uh, more of, of its prerogatives uh, uh, or for the benefit of the individual. Uh, and the main problem for the conservatives of all sorts uh, in Russia is that the constitution forbids ideology. The second one is Ukraine. Uh, liberals uh, are uh, against, and some uh, even liberals part that are part of this, the, the, the so-called uh, Sistema, are against, uh, were against, uh, for instance, uh, um, Crimea. Uh, the re regaining uh, of, of, of Crimea by Russian or occupation, it depends uh, again from which ideological camp, camp you, uh, you come. Um, and of course, uh, the conservatives uh, thought that uh, uh, all of Ukraine, especially Kiev, is Russian historical territory. Uh, Kiev is called the mother of all Russian towns, of all Russian cities. Uh, and they thought that uh, the action of, of government was uh, actually uh, far from uh, satisfactory. Uh, and the realists uh, are the ones who won't be, who weren't that, uh, that loud during the, uh, uh, during the Crimea operation, but then uh, after it happened, they would, uh, they would agree with it. And this is why uh, one of the, uh, uh, the greatest names, if not the greatest name of, of contemporary Russian political thought, 
uh, Alexander Gilevich Dugin, uh, said that the realists in Russia uh, are actually hidden liberals. So that uh, uh, he says that they divide them into fifth and sixth column. Fifth column coming from the Spanish Civil War, of course, being the traitors. You call all the liberals uh, traitors, being both the systemic and, and non uh, systemic ones. And of course, uh, uh, the realists who uh, are stopping the government before it, it does something patriotic, but then appeases it uh, and, and tries, to, tries to level down the ground. Uh, the third question is, uh, is the position of central bank. The conservatives are against the central bank, saying that actually it is part of the uh, globalist uh, financial system controlled by the Fed and so on, uh, whereas realists, again, wouldn't speak about it and liberals would agree with it. Um, the most vocal uh, opponent of the central bank is a famous Russian economist, uh, Valentin Katasonov, uh, who used to work in, in, in the, uh, in the uh, glo uh, global financial institutions and knows them uh, very well from within. Um, and the target uh, is uh, Nabulina, the, Nabulina, the, the um, uh, head of the Central Bank of Russia. Uh, the point with the Central Bank is also connected to the Constitution is that Central Bank is independent. So whatever... Excuse me, your time is... Uh, can I have okay. two more minutes? I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, there is uh, only only uh, one point that I, that I wanted to make, and I wrote uh, pages on it, but, but I won't be able to uh, to present it. It is that uh, all of these camp, uh, camps uh, within the system, uh, except for the conservatives, uh, have their uh, institutional ground. So the the base, the the the, the, the barracks of the liberals is. Uh, Vyša škola ekonomiky, the higher school uh, of, of uh, economy, the university. That of realists, it is Mugimo, Moscow uh, State uh, uh, University for International Relations. Whereas conservatives, and I'm sure this would be a surprise for, for uh, uh, Western uh, political thinkers, uh, probably because of the, the, the self perpetuated propaganda, is that conservatives actually don't have a uh, uh, don't have an institution. Uh, they, they have a club, uh, so there are very prominent conservatives in Russia, and very influential, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, th there was only one att attempt for, for them to gain ground at the Moscow State University uh, during uh, several years when Dukin uh, was uh, holding the part of the Cathedra of Sociology. Uh, but then uh, when uh, his views uh, were uh, so to softly say, different from those of, uh, of the realists uh, uh, after May 2014, then uh, he, he uh, was forced to go for the, from the university. So basically, the conservatives uh, don't, uh, don't have their, their ground. And most of Russian conservatives actually think that Russia is dominated uh, by uh, liberals and by uh, by so-called hidden uh, uh, liberals who, who belong to the realist uh, thought. Again, uh, thank you, thank you for listening. And again, I, I'm I'm sorry for oversimplification. This is something that that needs uh, a much broader lecture, if not uh, if not a whole separate conference. Thank you very much. Milan Subotic, who is unfortunately having some uh, examination in Vienna uh, today. And uh, just in continuance, what Simon was speaking, he edited this very nice piece uh, last year. It's called Second Russia, or the Liberal Western Russia, presenting uh, 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 contemporary criticists or liberal uh, 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 who are against uh, uh, criticizing Putin and speaking about many things like uh, one of the pieces was how geopolitics now took the place of former Marxism and so on and so on. So it's very nice piece and it's, it's a great uh, pity that uh, we didn't have it uh, today with us. Uh, well, uh, the idea of the first panel when we organized that was uh, to make it as a, some kind of, let me say, challenges of a different perspectives than uh, what is, if we could say at least, uh, with, with all the uh, uh, conditioning, uh, uh, mainstream of contemporary liberal democratic uh, approaches and so on. So actually we, we had one conservative, uh, uh, contemporary conservative uh, approach, one, uh, uh, let me say, uh, Russian uh, uh, presentation of different streams within Russia, and I will try to, uh, as brief as it's possible, 
uh, to present some methodological uh, issues and methodological challenges about what is power, how do you uh, uh, approach the power, and uh, how is political theory actually contemporary dealing with that. So this is uh, basically uh, what, what I'm going to speak uh, is going to be one uh, simplification of or just the basic outlines of uh, the first chapter of uh, my book uh, from 2013. It's called The Dark Corridors of Power. And it's called uh, uh, conspiracy and political theory. The whole idea is actually how to deal with non-transparent uh, uh, power uh, within political theory that's been more or less uh, uh, contemporary, trying to avoid these uh, tricky issues. Uh, in the meantime, I got quite a lot of different uh, 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 material, and uh, I hope that finally it's going to end up as a separate book. Uh, just let me start. What is basic idea? Actually. I quote uh, uh, Todd Sanders and Harry West, who managed to, to make very beautiful uh, and very uh, uh, provocative uh, 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 collection of work called Transparency and Conspiracy, actually. That's where I got the idea. When they said that actually today we are convinced that we live in the world of full transparency, and it seems, on the other hand, that things have never been such a uh, so, uh, less uh, clear, transparent, and understandable. And actually, this is what I really could uh, 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 sign up with. And uh, I think that actually, the basically, uh, with the, in the time when we speak about the full uh, 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 implementation of a, a liberal democracy system, uh, we have a lot of uh, 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 moments and aspects of something that is very much resembling traditional uh, politics of Imperi Arcana, uh, the famous uh, uh, saying from the 17th, 18th century, so-called uh, uh, power state, uh, 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 secrets of empire, and uh, uh, ragione di stato, or the state reason, and so on and so on. Uh, so actually, I just briefly return to the, the one of the causes of uh, this development that actually the whole this enlightening uh, 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 system uh, that was being developed in the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century that was led by uh, people who were insisting that they are developing an approach that's going to promote the light, uh, the transparency, the openness against the uh, Arcana Imperi. Uh, was, uh, you know, mostly French and lightning, but also in England and in many other places. Actually, somehow they end up bar organizing uh, 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 most of them secret societies of different kinds. Like this, we spoke a lot about Carbonaris, about different associations that were collecting uh, liberals in the 19th century, while they were fighting against basically Metami, who was the symbol of the uh, imperial conservatism at that time. The problem is actually that uh, somehow you end up in something which Marxists would define as dialectic of uh, insisting that you are fighting for the openness and transparency, but on the other hand, uh, you are creating very close societies uh, in very arcanistic, if I may say, approaches who continue the, uh, in more or less uh, 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 some way to work up until now. So actually, uh, this I uh, uh, I find it as very problematic and, and one of the biggest problems for political theory that actually it is avoiding uh, uh, of dealing with such a, a so-called esoteric uh, knowledges. I mean, take a look, for example, about secret uh, uh, services. I'm going to speak upon that. Uh, in particular, but actually they are dealing with some uh, esoteric knowledge which is not uh, 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 possible to be known by normal people or democratic citizen and whatsoever and so on. There is quite a lot of that. I mean, so I give quite a lot of examples reminding to actually uh, some of the famous cases like this Reagan's Contra Affaire in which actually you have very interesting development that uh, uh, leaders of liberal, uh, the most developed liberal democracy at that time were cooperating in some ways with the uh, 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 killers actually in the uh, all over Latin America with very non-transparent organization but also managing somehow to cooperate with Iran who was perceived as uh, one of the big challenges and so on and so on. And the other uh, uh, point uh, from which I start actually was the famous kiss uh, uh, between uh, Giulio Andreotti, the famous Italian politician, uh, and uh, Salvatore Totorina, famous uh, uh, or infamous, better to say, uh, Italian mafiosi who was leading the mafia at that time. This is the famous uh, uh, kiss d'onore, bacio di onore, kiss of honor 
the day exchange in 90, uh, uh, 1987. And actually, this was documented, uh, this was even depicted in the movies and so on. So actually, I'm asking, is this aberration, this cooperation between Giulio Andreotti as a leader, at that time prime minister, and then after that uh, 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 president, or this might be uh, 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 explained just as a, a, how should I say, logical consequences of the system that was uh, established in 1943 and 1947. Why do I speak about that? Because Mafia, as we know, played very huge uh, part in the liberation uh, of Sicilia in uh, 1943. And on the other hand, uh, during 1947, which were the crucial elections in uh, uh, Italy, when the Communist Party was very strong, supported by Stalin and so on, uh, Americans basically, uh, together with Vatican, Mafia helped Christian democracy to somehow win the elections and to preserve uh, uh, Italy within the uh, so-called liberal uh, uh, states. So actually, you, you have one very, how should I say, problematic thing, but also I, as a political theorist, uh, uh, have uh, the need uh, somehow to cope with that and to explain how it is really functioning. Can I give another, several other examples of uh, this kind, like uh, uh, the way uh, the famous uh, uh, issue about the establishment of the Federal Reserves in 1913, which was very often perceived as a, some kind of conspiracy or coup d'etat and so on. Then again, uh, for example, for us who are dealing with European uh, uh, studies here, uh, usually when we speak about the uh, uh, founders of uh, founding fathers of EU, we speak about Schumann, Monet, Admiral de Gaspari, uh, Spark, and so on, but nobody mentioned Joseph Rettinger, who actually happens to be, according to official CIA uh, histories, one of the most important figures that was connecting everybody who was involved from, I don't know, uh, Vatican, uh, Masonic Lodges, uh, uh, Kingdom Houses, uh, 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 Corporation, uh, MI6, uh, and political elites, and so on. And finally, I give example of something to, about which we finally listen to quite a lot. This is an organization that's been established in 1945, and this is Bilderberg uh, Group. And it's very interesting that the first uh, meeting was uh, the year before uh, Roman treaty uh, uh, was uh, uh, negotiated and started and so on and so on and, and I'm explore, uh, exploring this uh, 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 different uh, 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 how should I say points in which Bilderberg was connected uh, with uh, EU development including the way Herman Van Rompuy was uh, somehow elected as the first president of EU. Uh, finally I, I'm speaking about that actually all those things uh, are, are reminding us that the uh, theory of Arcana is still vivid somehow and very useful in understanding really how political politics function today. I remind them that uh, Roberto Bobbi already in 1984 uh, spoke about this problem for, uh, for uh, political theories that actually we do not deal quite a lot and enough with so-called invisible power. And uh, 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 the, the problem is we spoke quite a lot that actually political philosophy and political theory are uh, developing in the way that uh, uh, pupils there or students are forced to avoid dealing with concrete politics with anything that's going on. Unfortunately, this is the same case uh, in, in Serbia. And I speak about methodological issues and other problems that political theory is dealing with. And uh, I conclude actually that uh, if we, we my, let me say, modest and not so modest, unfortunately, political experience in this field. Basically, uh, uh, it seems that I use this metaphor of iceberg, actually, that at least, I don't know, one third or maybe one quarter of the, of the uh, real politics is connected with the transparent or institutional uh, uh, politics. And I think the majority of real politics is still very much connected with what we do not speak. I remind about the idea of why I call it conspiracy, like basically Latin word conspirare, bringing together, organizing something out of the reach of the rest of the uh, uh, people who are involved. And uh, I tried to define uh, uh, how could we define, the, let me say, conspirology uh, in scientific way uh, as uh, some kind of a necessary addition to what we have now as a political theory. And I'm using this metaphor that we are more like, the, not like a spy, because spy can get the documents. We are not able to get the documents very often, but we have to play some role of, let me say, uh, intelligence officer who is picking up different pieces and trying some 
somehow to reconstruct and to make as possible co as coherent theory. Of course, he's very often, uh, how should I say, uh, long, uh, often he doesn't have all clues, but this is the best that we can get, I think, to understand what is really going on. And uh, in the next part uh, of the paper, I give, uh, I think, five examples. I'll briefly remind upon that. The first one is about system of the secret services who are uh, now existing. Uh, and actually, what is very striking for me is that actually the most uh, uh, known, the most powerful secret services are those that are connected with the most powerful liberal democracy. Uh, United States of America and uh, 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 United Kingdom and uh, even uh, uh, Bundesrepublik of Deutschland. And I insist very often here in the public uh, debates that actually, unfortunately, uh, uh, sure, safe liberal democracy is very much dependent on the strong systems of power and uh, even secret power uh, uh, that has to be uh, developed. But the problem is actually, and this is uh, very often spoken about the CIA, that somehow uh, strong secret services tend to uh, 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 develop as uh, they call it now deep state or uh, separate state which are having their own uh, very often uh, black uh, uh, operation, black sources of money and even uh, as we know from CIA the services for liquidation uh, I remind you about the church committee investigation from the end of the 70s for which I don't think it didn't change quite a lot after that. Uh, that still, and there, uh, uh, the other thing is that they start to create their own politician uh, infiltration, and somehow secret services tend to over uh, 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 take uh, slowly uh, plenty of aspects of the state, and somehow uh, even the uh, state by itself. Uh, the other example is, of course, we spoke quite a lot about that. This history of secret societies. Uh, uh, of course, we know uh, mostly about uh, uh, Freemasonry, actually, but here is Benaigrit, uh, uh, Illuminati, Templars, uh, uh, very interesting stories about uh, uh, connections and relationship uh, uh, between the Vatican and, uh, and the Freemasons who have actually, I think, uh, uh, defined 19th century because they were mostly, uh, uh, I think, in some way, just hypothesis that many of ideologies of the 19th century ideology wars could be traced back to basically fight between the Vatican and the uh, Freemasonry. Then we have this string going from Cecil Rhodes up to, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Chatham House, uh, 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 Tavistock Institute, uh, Roman Club, uh, Club uh, today, then uh, uh, Council for uh, Foreign Affairs in, in America, and so on and so on, and uh, many other examples. The third uh, 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 a bunch of issues is uh, connected uh, with something which we could call like occult sciences, uh, magia, uh, telepathy, uh, paranormal knowledges, and so on and so on. I trace it back to the Renaissance, which we forgot actually is the birthplace of uh, uh, contemporary political theory, but on the other hand was the time when actually people were most interested for this kind of uh, knowledges, if I may say. And I remind you actually that one of the fathers of the contemporary political theory, uh, Jean Baudin, who wrote, of course, six uh, books about the Republic, uh, was the most known at his time for the book called De la Démonomie uh, de Saussier uh, from the uh, 1580s. It had uh, 20 uh, 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 different editions uh, during his time, and this was his history of, uh, I don't know, witches, uh, uh, sorcering, uh, and so on and so on. He was insisting on very harsh punishment of everybody who was involved, and so on and so on. And I give contemporary examples like Stargate, the famous project in which CIA and Pentagon were investigating possibility to use telepathy, for example, and so on, or another for, uh, from, uh, from uh, a German, if I may say, second uh, Nazi Germany, there were plenty of stories, including uh, uh, one very interesting example, uh, the Walter Schellen, the famous there, uh, uh, a spy, uh, insisted that actually the way they located Mussolini in 43, before Skorzeny liberated him, uh, was by using these kind of knowledge, like astrology and so on, at least what he said. Uh, then the uh, fourth thing is uh, religious cults, actually. Uh, just briefly, uh, CIA especially was in Europe uh, uh, very much accused that it's using, like abusing Scientology, different cults and uh, moons and so on. And many other things I remind you about the uh, uh, accidents of uh, in John, uh, Jonestown in Guyana 
1978 and in 1995 when Aum Shinriku in Tokyo killed so many people that actually cults are very problematic uh, uh, and very easily usable uh, for uh, different kind of subversion and so on and so on. And finally I'll finish with mafia with whom I started actually uh, the, the point that uh, criminal uh, sphere exists and it has existed uh, during uh, all, all the times in any uh, uh, societies is very attractive for any politician who wants to use it and as we know there are a lot of, I, I, I don't have time about uh, uh, this famous uh, relationship between Kennedys and Sam Giancana who helped them through uh, Frank Sinatra to won, win the elections in the 60s but then again uh, after that uh, uh, they, they wanted to cut him down and so on then uh, many of the recent researchers about connection between uh, Meyer Lansky, Mossad that was depicted in the second uh, 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 movie on Godfather and so on and so on. So actually I conclude by uh, defining some somehow that we have to be aware of this so-called underground and as I call it dark system of power which exists in any uh, country including liberal democracies and avoidable uh, this is what Professor Friedman said that you cannot move power out you have to learn how to deal with how to understand and especially for somebody who is still trying to defend the liberal democracy as the basic uh, uh, framework for our existence it is important uh, to know that these things exist and how to deal uh, uh, with them and how to defend your society from uh, uh, many of them. Uh, and the uh, final part, I deal of course with the uh, methodological and epistemological questions which are of course very tricky and more demanding if you are trying to deal with uh, those kind of things where you are all the time at the verge of fantasies or uh, many other things. Uh, so actually, the, I just mentioned the problems uh, that we uh, have to deal with, with the things, uh, knowing that many of the documents, for example, of Second World War, are classified and they will be out of the reach for us for another 100 years. Uh, then I, I put actually that uh, uh, geo geopolitics is very useful for understanding many of uh, those uh, uh, things. Uh, then I remind about uh, many uh, of the so-called uh, uh, conspiracy theories that came out to be real things. I remind you that actually Holocaust uh, was very long treated by the Nazis as a pure conspiracy theory before there were evidence very soon, uh, very uh, late uh, at the end of the uh, 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 Second World War, then Operation Paperclip, the famous one in which you know thousands of uh, uh, Nazi uh, scientists were taken away and, uh, 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 in America and I, I think that they recently just uh, opened and uh, declassified all those documents. So actually the point is how, uh, uh, again I'm speaking about analogies, logical reconstructions and so on and trying to ask is it possible to make stringent uh, uh, scientific conspirology in that uh, uh, sense and uh, I finish uh, uh, with uh, uh, a reminding about the false flag operation uh, possibilities to use these dark uh, spaces of power for uh, coup d'etat which is often happening and so on uh, reminding about the popular culture and Wikileaks who have really contributed quite a lot recently including uh, uh, the classifying documents from the first two uh, Bilderberg uh, meetings in 1944 uh, 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 and 55 and I finish with a uh, 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 lot of uh, uh, problems uh, that we have to deal with Finally, I have to say that I'm not the only lunatic trying within the mainstream uh, uh, science to deal with those issues, but actually in the last 10 years uh, or 15 years there have been several very serious researches going into that uh, direction and uh, the mainstream scientists are slowly starting to deal with it. There is a beautiful collection of George Marcus from 2000, uh, he called it Paranoia Within the Limits of Reason and a uh, wonderful methodological, philosophical collection uh, that David Cole, the philosopher from uh, 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 Australia, has done. It's called the theory of uh, 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 conspiracy theories, philosophical debate. And finally, in 2012, I was very surprised when I saw that actually even Rutledge, such a famous uh, publishing house, uh, 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 published the book on Bilderberg Club. Sorry for taking more time. Thank you very much. Thank you.